Am I correct in saying you got death threats over this comic? You are correct. And I guess this is an intense start. Thanks for having me, by the way. What happened? Well, so uh, I write a weekly comic for the Colorado Sun newspaper. Um, and when I was going to write this one, the Anguish Garden that you're holding in your hand, um, they interviewed me about it before it came out. And uh, I said it was an allegory for leading white supremacist movements. There's no white supremacist mm -hmm. in it. The article talks about like what it all is, right? But uh, so the headline that they chose was a uh, graphic novel tackles white supremacy, uh, which you know, is fine. And so uh, somebody from- it's good marketing, but still. Yeah. So yeah. someone from uh, uh, Comicsgate, which is a whole thing. Uh, Comicsgate is a group that is uh, sort of known for targeted harassment campaigns against uh, women and people of color who write comic books. Generally, uh, mm -hmm. they're, uh, the, the more benevolent members or the less mal malicious members, I'll say, uh, they're generally saying, they use terms like forced diversity and stuff like that. So like, Mm, uh, they're upset that it. sort of all superheroes are not white men as they've been, mm. you know, for the last hundred years or so. Uh, so mm -hmm. this this person that sent me death threats, it was from an anonymous account. It was on um, Instagram and uh, they just Christmas, Christmas Day, in fact, <laughs> they sent me. Yeah, they sent me all these death threats and they were hashtagging Comicsgate because they wanted Comicsgate to come after me as well. Uh, and I, fortunately, I guess it didn't take, uh, didn't take root. They sent me, uh, maybe four different death threats. And then, uh, I had a friend of mine try to get the police to look into it. They didn't want to. Um, then I had another friend who worked at city hall who knew, a uh, high ranking official there and she made the police look into it. Um, Thank God. Yeah, they didn't really come up with anything, but I, I could tell from the account that the person was in Littleton, Colorado. This comic, it you said it's an allegory, so it doesn't actually tackle the i the or it doesn't mention like the white supremacy in it. Am, am I correct? Reading it, I didn't notice it, but I wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no white supremacists were harmed in the making of the book, but I I <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to uh, you know if it's not white supremacy, any movement. That where people are indoctrinated mm -hmm. and find themselves doing something evil when they enter with good intentions mm -hmm. that's what i wanted to examine mm -hmm. and um yeah. i think fiction's a powerful way to examine it. it's also a powerful way to inoculate yourself against you know some of the ways that we're deceived or drawn into movements that we don't want to be a part of mm. this that was actually uh what drew me into the uh, comic as I was reading it, um, it is that exact idea this is the only comic I have ever read <laughs> nice um and yeah uh and immediately like like we we're talking before we hit record um immediately after finishing it I brought in my girlfriend we went through it together and then I went and bought the second one um the continuation <laughs> and unfortunately I'm gonna be out of the country for the next like two yeah. weeks so I have to wait till it gets here wait till I get back to finish it but it is really really well done uh, and it tackles well actually uh yeah let's go ahead let's tackle this idea so looking uh -huh. here i think it's really important people know the time of the year this was written specifically because we are now interviewing post-covid right. this was written pre-covid is yeah, that right yeah and uh yeah so you know there's a premise in the book uh that it's after a war with space aliens the human beings won and that uh, certain human beings believe that there's a portion of the uh, population that is infected by the aliens and they were trying to force them into a quarantine. And um, all of that, I wrote it like, I did a Kickstarter for this book. The Kickstarter, so I had, a written, I had written a script and I was doing a Kickstarter to hire the artist to work with me. The Kickstarter happened in February of 2020 and then Ha. Oh, yeah. wow. Then the world stole my story and a worldwide yeah. pandemic and lockdown and all that stuff. Yeah. 
Immediately. And how people were reacting from within your book, the polarization, the tribalization that was happening, the um, justification uh, and the self echo chambers and all of that we saw on both sides within COVID. And what with that in mind, was there a specific event in your life or because that drove you to see this as a potential reaction from people? Okay, uh, before I answer your question directly, I'll say it's important to me to sure. uh, to create art that engages issues, but not in a way that it feels like I have all the answers, right? Because sometimes just by mm. raising the issues, people who are more versed in the issue or have more direct experience, um, they can react in a way that uh, that teaches me, you know, improves the world. But I think uh, so many problems are uh, intangible and invisible. They're just like floating us around, uh, floating around us. But when art puts a finger on it, then suddenly you're like, oh, that is something. That is something I can do something about, you know. Um, specifically, though, I was thinking about um, during uh, Trump's presidency, there was a period in the midterms where there was a lot of rhetoric around uh, these caravans that were coming from South America to rape and pillage and destroy everything in America. And they mm -hmm. caravans, they're coming, they're coming. And uh, as soon as the voting period was over, we heard nothing about the caravans. Mm -hmm. So this uh, idea of making other human beings into monsters in order to manipulate people uh, was really fascinating to me. I mean, I've certainly experienced this somewhat in terms of um, uh, like, when I was younger, popular media representations of uh, black uh, manhood, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. idea of being mm -hmm. like made beastly. And, you know, uh, there's that whole thing of, um, I remember a story that I read when I was a teenager. I grew up in Atlanta and I, the, the police shot and killed uh, this black man who was naked. Like, now he was muscular. But he was he was naked, right? Still, but uh, yeah. and all they had to do was say, "Well, we were scared, right?" Because there's been enough in society to make him into a beast. Yeah. And so you yeah. know, there's so much interest. So that that stuff, I really wanted to uh, mm -hmm. deconstruct because you know, if if it's happened to me and it's happened to other people, how does how does it happen? And then. How is that belief that other people are monsters used to manipulate us into um, things that we're doing out of fear rather than out of our out of our best selves? Mm -hmm. We did get deep immediately. We got right into it. <laughs> immediately. I am so glad too. <laughs> from our conversation um, in person, I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. Right on. This is going to be fun. How would you see this conversation happening that you're bringing up happening at scale across society and happening well? It's a good question. Uh, I think um, one I would say, I am not a qualified sort of like facilitator, uh, like to lead a group in these issues, right? Um, I say that because I think um, mm -hmm. often uh, when I get interviewed uh, like on by the press or on the radio, which happens ever so often. But uh, when it happens, sometimes I get a person who is like thinking because I'm writing about the issue or because I may be demographically affected by the issue that I am the person to um, speak with authority on the issue, um, which mm -hmm. isn't always the case, right? Like there are people who are um, trained facilitators. There are people who've done work on um, studying how to dismantle oppression. Um, so I just wanna, I wanna put that caveat there. Uh, I do think you put the, you identify something really strong. Like, so I'm super like a child of the twilight zone, right? Uh, so uh, did you, so you haven't read a comic. Did, did you watch Twilight Zone, the original? I have seen, I haven't seen enough to say I've watched it. I've seen sporadic well, episodes. This is good, cause I could tell you about it. All right, so the guy who created it, the guy who does okay, yeah. uh, the speech in, in all of them, you know, the suit, like a picture of world, mm -hmm. that guy, Rod Serling. Uh, yeah. So yeah. he was a writer 
television writer for about 12 years before he did the Twilight Zone. And um, mm -hmm. he was constantly trying to talk about sexism, war, oppression, racism. Um, when Emmett Till got lynched in the early 50s, Rod Serling tried to write something about it, and he always got censored, like always. And he would, uh, he would go to the press and be like, I tried to write about Emmett Till and they censored me. So they called him the angry young man of television. Um, he was not a fan of sci-fi or uh, fantasy. And he just happened upon this idea that if he put his messages in sci-fi or fantasy, he wouldn't be censored. So he reached out to Ray Bradbury. He was like, yo, teach me how to read, to read, to write sci-fi. Uh, that's not a direct quote, but he was basically like, uh, just figuring out how to do it. So when you watch that show, um, so many people focus on like the twist, the sci-fi fantasy elements, but for him, it was all about talking about volatile issues in the world. Um, a paraphrase of an actual quote from him was, uh, when I wrote about Democrats and Republicans, I got censored. When I wrote about Martians, I didn't, you know? Um, I think the power of that is hmm. instead of like me coming out and saying, you, 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 it's, uh, let's take that charge out of it. Let's look at these people over here. I mean, that's mm -hmm. something that's worked all the way back to mm -hmm. Jesus and parables or uh, Aesop and fables, right? Yeah. Like, if you take the, the, the finger right. off, like you stop pointing at the person, it doesn't trigger the defensive response. They can look at it at distance. And then um, sometimes we have that moment where we're like, oh, that's something I do. <laughs> Maybe I should think about that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's one mm -hmm. of the uh, beautiful powers of fiction. I want to run okay. with that um, because that also partially answered the question. Um, but was it always your uh, intention and or intentional development of a skill set to write comics with that framework, with that frame? Or is that something that you developed as you started writing? No, it's interesting, man. I mean, because uh, in our initial conversation, I was saying I've only been writing for a few years. Um, 2017 was the first thing, mm -hmm. but, uh, the answer would be yes. You know, it's wild. <laughs> yeah. Like the stuff mm -hmm. I really, uh, the art that I've really loved throughout my life has been art that's made me understand the humanity of somebody who was different from me or, uh, gave me a new mm -hmm. perspective that I didn't have before. Like I mentioned Twilight Zone, Star Trek's always been really strong in that regard. Um, growing up in Atlanta, I did not have a lot of uh, contact or connection with people who were outwardly involved and uh, who, who were outwardly identified as LGBTQ, like any part of that group. And um, without realizing it, the sort of uh, socialization, being in the South, being in church, like all these different things made me not recognize their humanity in a way that I would have liked to. But when I saw art created by people from those communities, it allowed me to connect with their humanity mm -hmm. in a way that um, that I hadn't before. And I was like, oh, this is, you know, like, cause I think when you don't, you can have a lot of unexamined thoughts, like, you know, because if you think about the, I'm gonna say tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of like little rules that we learn for life. We don't examine each one, right? Like there's social agreements when we, like, you know, like a social agreement that we haven't said out loud is that I, when I come in the show, I'm not going to like insult or attack you. Right. Like that's, you know, like <laughs> we, yeah, yes, we don't feel like true. we should have to say that. So if you think about how many unspoken mm -hmm. rules that we absorb through our life, um, I think it's easy to recognize mm -hmm. how biases can kind of creep in because we're just absorbing it. And it's not until mm -hmm. we get to the place of shining a light on those particular biases, then we can be like, oh, I didn't even know that I was thinking like that. And then you can try to like, you know, um, mm. correct it and, and do better. So on that, um, how to ask this again, this, the fact that I'm struggling to ask these questions is a really fun sign. <laughs> um, cause it's, it's right at the edge of my knowledge, which is why I love these conversations. Saw that as one of your uh, tenets uh, for your podcast. Okay, this is how... Your knowledge. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. I, uh, I, I never bring someone on here if I think yeah. I know what they're going to say. Um, that is, that is a rule for me. Um, I will only bring people on if I believe that there is something interesting, something unique, something that's just outside of my knowledge. Because if I don't fully understand a concept or if there's a yeah. gap in my knowledge, then there's a gap in someone who's listening. And I am totally fine raising my hand saying, I'm the idiot, so, explain it to me. Um, live one-on-one on camera while we're recording so yeah. someone else can learn. I love that. Um, okay. I'm going to kind of go on a little t- uh, tangent rant thing here and then I'm going to ask a question. I want to let me know your thoughts on this. Um, so I, uh, when we met okay. in person, um, my just for context, my girlfriend is black. Mm-hmm. We've had a lot of these conversations on race um, and it has been mm-hmm. eye-opening. For sure. The conversations that are from growing up, um, grew up in Maine. It's like, I, I think I wouldn't quote me on this, but I've been told it's the whitest state um, or it's at least known for that, whether it's factual a, or not. I have a um, friend who grew up in Enfield, Maine, and uh, I visited her in college. Okay. Yeah, oh, and I, I had never been to such a small town and so much snow. And her father was a Black Panther, but... Uh, yep. She, he wasn't present in her life. So she grew up with her mother who was white and everybody just kind of assumed she was Italian, mm-hmm. you know? So that was my main experience. Yep. yep. That's kind of the thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that, that's pretty part. The, um, a, I've come to this idea and I want to hear your thoughts on this, whether you agree, disagree, think it's accurate, think it's not, what nuances okay. can we get to the, There seems to be this balance, not balance, two forces that are at work when it comes to what you're, what you've talked about when it comes to, uh, you talked about black men in TV and how it's, it has been portrayed as Mm -hmm. like this beast, right? So there's this D and even in your, um, in your comic, how you, the idea where you can alien a human, you can dehumanize them. That concept seems to have two prongs or two not sides to it but two uh forces with it one is from the actual marketing of it right so the tv Mm -hmm. that you referenced um we see the media and you see uh how that impacts culture it's it's no surprise that the things that impact are that are popular in uh TV and media then impact the culture and it trickles down. Um, So that's one side. The other side is as it trickles down, it's kind of the other effect of it. And this is where I would love your insight. Seems to be the other effect is that becomes personalized. That becomes accepted. Um, So far, would you agree with that analysis? There's this one perception or this one idea it's presented and then it's accepted as two separate things yeah i think so because that that fits into what i'm saying about the unexamined things that we absorb so it does become sort of our personal outlook exactly exactly so with that concept um and the book or comics i keep saying books i I read hundreds of books a year so it's my natural state but this comic um it addresses that in the marketing aspect in that first aspect you present it let's present the idea in a new way um it's and that i believe is in my personal belief is that is the first step that you can't have the personal identity shift and identity change and perception one to another change without addressing the overall cultural person how the culture is perceiving and presenting the idea in my yeah. personal view, I don't think you can have the individual without the uh, culture first. So uh, with that assumption, this comic, phenomenal at that first step. Um, in your experience, what would help? And I don't know if you'll have an answer, but if you do, I would love to hear your perspective. What would help on that second one when it comes to that identity? That Because um, like you said, the demonization of uh, black men in TV and that making that perception of a beast what are things from a personal level 
that at once the media and scale has been changed that on a personal side people can do to make that change uh yeah i mean i think that's certainly a big question right because um this particular thing that we're talking about black men as uh beast or monsters is deeply ingrained in american history like from slavery right so um basically america yeah. ha has not existed without that built into it so it's not uh, an easy thing to shift out of the culture um but I think um, I think trying to connect with somebody's humanity, who they are as a person, before you letting that be more dominant in your mind than uh, who they are demographically, right? So it's not uh, mm -hmm. this is my Mexican friend, so he would do this, right? It's this is my friend who likes blah blah blah, mm -hmm. who is Mexican, you know. Um, because I think, you know, yeah. if you if you define people in your mind based on who they are demographically, you bring all the expectations along with it and it actually blinds you um, from seeing mm. uh, fully who they are, you know. Uh, this makes me think of, uh, do, do you uh, curse on this podcast or no? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fuck it up. It's good. All right. You're fine. So this makes me think of uh, 2016. I was uh, I was single. I was traveling alone um, in Europe, and um, I went to Prague. I was staying at this uh, hostel that was called the Mosaic Party Hostel, and it was aptly named as fuck because it had a, a nightclub on the bottom <laughs> floor. I was like, well, I'm going to dance, right? People are dancing. It was like a Friday night, I think. And so mm -hmm. I go down, and it's like packed. Like, the dance floor is packed. There's like three bachelorette parties happening. Like it's just a place people go to hang out. Um, but I had not, this is before I had released any of my books or anything like that. Uh, I was, I had been selling insurance. So I just want to underscore that I was not like a famous dude, right? Um, three bachelorette mm -hmm. parties. I walk in, a girl from each bachelorette party makes a beeline to me. And I was like, huh, you know, mm -hmm. like what, what is that? And, they were all like, you should come, you should come party with us, blah, 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 blah. Um, now, if, I guess if I need my ego fed or if I were like more insecure, I would be like, yeah, you know, these girls love me out here in Prague, right? But it just felt weird. Uh, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I was traveling alone, so I was like, I'll go with one of them, I'll see, you know? So I walk over and um, they introduce me to the bride-to-be. Um, they like take pictures with me. But it's like, it's more like I'm a prop, you know, they're not really talking to me. So I was like, ah, this is weird. And they were like, you know, she's getting married in two weeks. And I was like, it's weird. So I bounced and I was just went and I was doing my own thing on the dance floor. Then a girl from the that bachelor party comes back to me. She points at the bride to be and she says, I can hook you up, but it's according to your game. And I was like, uh, didn't you say she's getting married in two weeks? And she says, Yes, but you are black, you are American, you are fantasy, right? Now, mm. what's interesting to me about that is, um, one, it has nothing to do with me as a person, right? It has to do with like whatever their yeah. ideas are of American blackness. Um, and it's connected to that, yeah. that same racism that makes the black man a beast. It's also the sexually proficient thing. Like, sure, I've benefited from that stereotype in the past, but it's, but you can't really separate <laughs> them, right? So like if, if you, uh, like if some, mm. if people are all smiling and happy because they believe one part of the stereotype, as soon as you step like a little bit outside of what they think you should be, then it flips to, uh, ire and like, uh, mm. it just turns hostile. You know, because it's still about a very mm -hmm. narrow vision of who you are as a human. And uh, I guess to end that story, you know, she said that you are black, um, you are American, you are fantasy. And I was like, what am I, the black dick fairy? And she left me alone. Uh, <laughs> that also taught me that my humor translates across cultures. Uh, apparently i was like i haven't apparently. even been in this country for more than 30 minutes i feel like i would wake up with like a like a, my liver missing or something you know what i mean like but you know like it's an interesting thing do you you know the the rapper 50 cent mm -hmm. uh you know he uh so when he mm -hmm. when he first came out 
basically people just heard he had been shot X amount of times. I don't remember how many times, but that was like, that was the whole, that was all the marketing. It wasn't, he's a good rapper. It wasn't like, check out his songs. It wasn't like this, what he talks about. It was just, he's been shot and he survived it. And like America couldn't wait. They were fiending for his album. And I think, you know, America has a obsession with black violence and, you know, which, so he leaned into that uh, sort of, I mean, he was a victim. He got shot. He was in the hospital. That doesn't make him like, like an action hero. Do you know what I'm saying? But he just leaned into these uh, mm-hmm. ideas of uh, American black masculinity as like black men as a beast. And he's made a fortune off of it. But I think uh, mm-hmm. getting, I know I told you that story, but getting more back to your question, I think there's this thing of like uh, every story that you tell is essentially building a relationship with the reader or the listener or whoever, right? So like uh, me and you, when we first met, um, we just spoke briefly, but we connected on some things. We had some things in common. And then that uh, Mm -hmm. made both of us interested in having deeper conversation. And I think it's the same, like you're talking Mm -hmm. about building off the uh, cultural assumptions you have to sort of flip those switches. These are the things that you already believe. You'll get people to be like, oh yeah, I do believe that. Or yeah, that makes sense. And then you can kind of lead them to the conclusion you want. But if you don't build those bridges with mm-hmm. them early, then they're not gonna follow you for the conclusion. So like if in our first conversation, mm-hmm. we had not connected, then whatever I have to say after that doesn't really matter. That is a, how do I say, results driven approach it's the approach that works with humans right i say results driven because it focuses more on what is the outcome that i want being we want this to change and then how is that likely or most likely to what am i what do i need to do to make that most likely and it becomes not i'm going i need to blow up or do x y and z get these emotions out but i need to approach the conversation differently um that in not just regarding racism specifically let's broaden the whole thing out any sort of social justice from what we've seen over the last specifically over the last four or five years um has been the a not a common approach I'll say I want to say it's been the opposite but I would say at least not the common approach what are your thoughts yeah, what I are agree. your what's yeah, your take I think on uh that? I feel like uh liberals appear appeal generally to um intellectualism and higher like moral superiority those are the two things that they make their appeal with usually like you know if um you can't even spell right you know mm-hmm. like or uh if you believe in this, you're a shit person, right? Um, I find that uh, people who are right-leaning mm-hmm. are very effective at appealing to fear um, and anger. So mm-hmm. this is what liberals are doing to destroy your children, right? So you get those messages. Um, mm-hmm. um, and both approaches fail to to try to connect with the human being on the other side. But what I think happens is as far as people who are racist, for example, and understand what it is and choose to do it, that's a minority of people. That's like a David Duke, right? Like Mm -hmm. that's somebody who's like, yes, I am in the clan. You know, I've made my decision. I know what I'm doing. Um, So that person's all Mm -hmm. the way at an extreme. And then there's this whole sort of like uh, birth of people who, uh, who are not in that extreme, but who might get pushed a little bit over the line by uh, their fear of losing white culture or something. And so people who are like a, like a David Duke, they spend their time coming up with phrases like white genocide and um, th- things like that to trigger people to come over to their side. Um, mm. Because the things that most people are really concerned about is, uh, the things that they're most concerned about are um, family, safety, um, are we going to have something to eat? Mm-hmm. Are we going to make it? Am I going to be able to take care of the people I love? And either side, whoever's on the extremes of either side, if they can trigger those things, they use that to bring the people closer to them. 
But I think what happens is we are often reacting to the minority, the vocal minority, the David Dukes, the comics gate people, like those kind of people. And those people do need to be shouted down. Mm -hmm. But in the act of shouting those people down, we're um, hurting and provoking the people who are not in those extremes. So like for myself, mm -hmm. I generally am trying to create art that um, is accessible to people who are not in those extremes so they can find where they fit on that line and connect to humanity. Because most, most people do not want to be an evil person. Most people, you know, there certainly are people who choose to, but I think most mm -hmm. people, the people, but that's always a minority is you're generally people who are, um, other people need other reasons to do bad things. Like, uh, we need to secure mm -hmm. our borders. We need to keep our family safe. You know, uh, these people are destroying us. Like they need to, they need to believe that stuff in order to do bad things. Cause then they can tell themselves they're good, but it's very few people who are like, this is an evil thing and I'm okay with doing it. And so if we're reacting to them all the time, the yelling that, that you're talking about, then we're actually sometimes pushing people who uh, would not be in that extreme further away from us. Mm. Mm. In your perfect world, how would you change this? You, so you have your, uh, this one comic and you have the second part of this, which I'm very excited. Do you have a timeline? Because you said there was three. Do you have a timeline uh, for the third? I'm hoping to do it next year. And the only reason I'm unsure about it is because uh, comic book artists are okay. a, whole, a whole thing to, to deal with. <laughs> we can talk about it more later, but yeah, it's a whole thing, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, so approaching it from the comic side, is there in, in your ideal world, how would you like, how would you go about these conversations? Would it be, oh, let's go the Twilight Zone and like, oh, I would love to direct a TV show. Would it be, I would love to make a shit ton of comics and tour this out? Would it be um, any other medium? What kind of medium would I, you I would say both. You prefer? know, so after I wrote my first graphic novel, which is called mm -hmm. The Burning Metronome, that was super Twilight Zone influence. Like, if you watch Twilight Zone and then you read it, you'll be like, yeah, this dude loves Twilight Zone, right? Um, but it did get me like... That's funny. You know, it, it was the beginning. And it got me a lot of um, press and stuff like that. It got me an agent. Mm -hmm. Even though that didn't lead to much, it got me an agent. Uh, and I, I think... Mm -hmm. um, so after I did that, one of my friends who I grew up in Atlanta with, he uh, he's a film editor for like uh, direct to cable movies. And uh, he was like, yo, man, will you will you write me a, a film? We worked on it. Uh, we, it's called Straw Man. We have a website for it. I think it's just strawmanmovie.com. Mm -hmm. But we had the money for it. And then the pandemic hit and the person who was uh, financing it backed out because uh, all of their businesses were like restaurants and bars. Um, yeah, but uh, Ooh, so we're working yeah. on getting it back up. But I think, um, so listen, I love comic books. I've been reading them since I was five. My dad is a journalist. He uh, wrote for USA Today for 30 years. Um, the He was deputy managing editor of the money section of USA Today. So when I was five, he wanted to encourage a love of reading wow. and he got me into comic books. So it's been a big part of my life. Um, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, I've only been writing them, uh, for a few years, but I am thankful that I have like been blessed with the hustle and ingenuity to be able to make a living at it. Um, but I definitely would like to expand. Like I love the medium. So I'm always going to try to do graphic novel stuff. Um, but I am also interested in doing, mm -hmm. uh, movies and television, like you mentioned. So I've written two scripts and um, with two different uh, sort of production groups, and they're both trying to raise the money uh, for those movies. The second one that I wrote, I wrote last, the end of last year. It was a uh, in the in the like nineteen eighty four. There were the movies Breaking and Breaking Electric Boogaloo. They were like introduced break dance into the world. Uh, that was a little break dance for you to and so so nice. uh, some dancers, yeah. <laughs> some b-boys i know wanted to do like a sequel um and mm -hmm. i and they asked me to write it 
-hmm. And that was challenging, actually, because I was like, dance movies are terrible, you know? Interesting. Uh, so I had to think really <laughs> about like how to not make it terrible. And uh, I thought about Ryan Coogler with uh, Creed, because mm -hmm. fight movies can be terrible, too. And uh, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, it's, it's mm -hmm. the emotional underpinnings. It's the it's the journey. Like the if you think of the dancing as mm -hmm. the icing on the cake, then what is the what is the substance? And um, mm -hmm. I wrote it. They liked it a lot. It that's on IMDb as Beyond Street Cred, and they're raising money for it. So let's see if it gets made. Who knows? You've also, you mentioned the hustle and ingenuity. And when we met in person, this was one of the first things we ended up diving into. Um, you said you got an agent you've, and then they did like shit. You did this pretty much by yourself from 2017. You, di you didn't lose money. Like people on this show, a good handful will probably know. I am operations manager for an investment fund. And one of the biggest things that I struggle with with brands is so many brands are losing money and have no idea. And even when they do have an idea, um, it's getting them profitable. A lot of people struggle with that. They start the business because they love it um, or because it's something to do or they lucked into it and they don't know how to actually keep it going. And it's you have worked your way through and you got this uh, really great agent. Am I correct in saying it was... Uh, Actually, I don't know if I can say that. I'll let you if it is. Um, you got yourself a really solid agent and then um, that didn't do much. So you end up hustling this all yourself. How did you learn about business? What what got you here? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so as I mentioned, my father's a business editor, journalist, um, and my mother... Uh, managed to bank when I was a kid. So um, so they both, I would say, have pretty practical business minds. My mother's more of an entrepreneur than my father is, but they both like um, early on, like taught me how to balance my checkbook. And, you know, I think I was 12. And my mother got me like a practice checking account, you know? Um, That's great. That's so great. <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was good to learn that stuff. Now, uh, I was working a nine to five. I think that your question might be best answered by me sort of speaking of the journey. And so I, of course, in, invite you to interject at wherever those things, you know, because I don't want to just talk for myself for 20 minutes. OK, so so I was working as nine to five uh, and I was not really digging it. I was doing well there, like, OK, financially, but well as an employee. But they were always just like messing with me uh just because uh, even though i uh, even though i accomplished all the objectives i wasn't uh enough of a conformist to their corporate culture i suppose so uh so i quit and uh i was like what am i gonna do now because i can't take it anymore and i uh started uh an insurance agency um through a dishonest popular company that I'm not going to name, but that had a that has lots of commercials on a television, and um, they promised that uh, first year agents make an average of eighty thousand dollars. So I was like, oh well, that means if I do half as well as the average, I'll at least make forty. And then I did it for two years, and most people made around twelve. So it was a lie. But what I got out of that was. It was the first time that I uh, ever only made money off of what I sold because there's no base salary. And um, learning that I was able to do that was important for me because um, I don't really have any like uh, safety nets, you know, like family wise or anything like that. Like if I if I go out, I go out, you know, so. Um, so I, I learned a lot of uh, a lot of structure, building my own business, and um, through the, through that, um, and like having an accountant that would advise me about like what are the best ways, you know, LLC versus S corp, like those kind of things. Um, keeping a spreadsheet of uh, you know what I make and what I spend, um, and always make sure balances with my accounts, having a business account, like all those different things, like some of the, those fundamental things. Um, I got from, 
four years working in insurance. Uh, so around 2016, I was like, this is terrible. I'm very unhappy. I'm not making very much money and I, and I don't like this. Cause like, you know, people with insurance, they get mad, you know, like when you, when you go to sell it to them, they'll be like, oh, I don't need this. I don't need this. And you'd be like, okay, but if you don't have this, something's going to happen and you won't have coverage. And they'll be like, I'll be fine. And then six months later, that thing happens and they're furious with me. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't mind people being angry with me about things I actually believe in, but insurance, I don't give a fuck about insurance. Like, you know, I don't need people angry with me about that, you know? So, uh, even though intellectually I knew it wasn't my fault, emotionally it was hard for me to deal with, you know? So, uh, so this is when the trip to Europe happened. I went, uh, this is my first time out of the country. I went for a month. I went to Berlin, Prague, Budapest, and London. And, um, I just, went to comic book places in all those countries. And, uh, you know, comics are something I've always loved. And I was like, you know, if I have to choose between the extremes of being happy and wealthy, or no, happy and broke or unhappy and wealthy, I would choose happy and broke. And that's not for everybody, not, you know, it's just, I had to be clear for myself. Uh, so then I was like, well, I'm gonna try my hand at writing. So I started listening to a few writers' podcasts. I came back and I did a Kickstarter campaign for the Bernie Metronome. And um, surprisingly, I was trying to get like $8,400 um, to just pay the artists and pay for printing. I wasn't even paying myself. And uh, I ended up raising 16000 Oh, wow. Yeah, and like somebody shared it in my old like undergrad alumni group. I hadn't talked to most of those people in decades. And, they were, and then they just started like, I was like, oh, well, these names popping up. I was like, I wonder what they look like now. You know, like it was just a whole thing. And uh, so people really engaged with it, which was beautiful and um, unexpected. And so I was like, okay, so I'm gonna do my best to honor this. Now, the beautiful thing about doing a Kickstarter is if you're wise with it, um, at the end, let's say you have 300 people who backed you. Um, for the amount that I got, I could print a thousand books. I upgraded them to hardcover. So a thousand hardcover books I printed in China because it's substantially less expensive than it is here. Um, and so that means I fulfilled the 300 people. And then I have 700 books that I could sell uh, and it's all profit, you know? Um, so that was sort of the beginning. Um, and then somebody at Regis University read it and I, I don't know how they got it, but they uh, offered me a job teaching in their master's program. So uh, that book made me a professor, which is crazy. That's I saw that on the on your site, and I was like, I didn't know that about him. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. They just uh, offered me a job, and then um, and I was like, I can I can teach in college, master. I, I, didn't, I was like, I've never taught before, but uh, they had me come in for like uh, they didn't tell me they were gonna offer me the job. They hired me to do a workshop. It went well. And then at the workshop, they were like, I want to talk to you about teaching here. And I was like, for real? <laughs> you know? So that was extraordinary. Then uh, around that time, the Denver Post was having difficulties because they were on, they're still owned by a, a hedge fund that's been sort of cannibalizing them for uh, like cutting, I think they're down to a third of the staff that they've had traditionally for, you know, 100 years or whatever. So, uh, some reporters left the post and decided they were going to start their own paper. That paper is the Colorado Sun. Um, and so they just kind of looked like Google who's doing comics in Denver. And they wanted to do a comic section and they met with me. And um, I obviously had never done a newspaper comic. So I was like, give me a couple of weeks. And I thought about what I could do. And I came back with a pitch and they liked it. That's that comic. What I miss. It's a, uh, it's been going on for five years. It's on the Colorado Sun's website. You can read it for free. There's no paywalls. There's no ads. But uh, that comic has won me three journalism awards, which I didn't even know I was a journalist. You know what I'm saying? It was crazy. But, wow. Do you tackle the same issues um, than the same, like the depth that you do? That was the challenge, right? Because I can't do long form stories. Um, so uh, that that was what I had to think about for a couple of weeks. So. 
uh, I came up with this premise because I thought, okay, if it's only going to be like one page, because we're not doing like a three panel, we're doing like a page because I just couldn't even figure out how to do a three panel comic. So uh, sounds like one page a week. Uh, then there can't be too many characters. Um, so I was like, maybe I'll start with two. But then I thought, oh, if the two characters are the same demographically, like if it's two black men or two women or whatever, then people will think that the comic is a black comic or a woman comic or whatever, right? So I thought uh, if I pick two characters who are um, demographically contrasted, then it will bring a lot more depth to it. So um, it's a white woman in her 50s and a black man in his 20s who are neighbors and they just talk about all the things happening in the world um, and various, some, some sp specific Colorado um, politics, social justice kind of thing. The premise of the, the book is that the woman was in a coma for 30 years. And so, cause I couldn't think of any reason why they would just be sitting and talking about everything happening. Yeah, so uh, so I was like, maybe he'll be explaining to her. We've kind of moved away from that premise a little more, but the comic's called What I Miss, like she missed 30 years. Yeah, and so we did a, a book of it, um, the first 100 comics and state representative Leslie Harrod wrote the foreword for it. Um, so I was like, comics is making me friends with politicians and maybe a professor? Like, I don't even understand, you know? One of the things that I have found in the conversations with the people that I bring on here, one of the most fascinating things is, um, and actually the last handful of guests specifically, which has been great, um, so many of them approach life with a very particular belief, and it seems like you have that same belief. Um, and if you do, I want to ask you where you got it. Um, but the belief is, I'll figure it out. So one lady uh, came on here and she's like, she called her and her friend call it. And I, I call it this from now on because I love it. It's, I'm self-certified. She bought a, yeah, she's like, uh, she wanted to learn how to dance or to become a dance teacher. So at 11, she started taking lessons. And at 12, she opened a dance studio in her house. Um, like that, just I'll figure it out and I'll go for it. Um, had someone else here I interviewed last week that was just went through a lot of shit in his life and was like, cool. Um, I figured out how to work on myself with this. Um, I think there's an opportunity to help other people through their own healing. Uh, I'll learn how to do Facebook. I'll learn how to do ads. I'll learn how to do the coaching, all this stuff. I'll figure it out. Um, I, my family had to do it with the businesses. We grew up on food stamps and now my younger brother has sold two companies for mid seven figures. Like we'll figure nothing that like, we don't know what the hell we're doing, but when we see a challenge and we see something in front of us, we're like, okay, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'll figure it out. Um, it seems like you've had that same belief. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. I would say it in part comes from my parents. Um, they met at uh, Cornell. So they had like sort of that Ivy league um, kind of like we'll start our own business thing going on. Um, but also, uh, well, they definitely, made sure that I never felt like I couldn't do something. So I'm thankful to them for that. But when it came to this thing there, uh, Robert Kirkman, he uh, is a comics writer who created The Walking Dead. He created the cartoon that became the show. Um, when he was pitching the comic book, I say cartoon, but he was pitching the comic book. Uh, at the time, horror had not sold well in comics for about uh, maybe 50 years. And so uh, he's pitching it. The guy's like, uh, you know, that's cool with the zombies, but, uh, you know, horror doesn't do really well. And so Kirkman's like, oh, well, I forgot to tell you the hook. The zombies are going to be an advanced team for an invading alien force. So the editor's like, oh, OK, let's try that. So they print it. It's doing well. It's like six months in. It's getting all this critical acclaim. Editor comes back to Kirkman. He's like, hey, man, I'm glad the book's doing good, but I don't see anything about the aliens. And Kirkman was like, oh, I just made that up. So you would, you know, print it, right? Publish it. I love that so much. That's so interesting. It is. And uh, we mentioned the uh, podcast, How I Built This, Guy Ross, the NPR podcast. The thing that I hear with all of those entrepreneurs, two, two common themes. One, um, they are willing to lie for an opportunity uh, because the gatekeeper is always somebody just making their best guess. They pretend like they're experts, but they're all just making their best guess. Uh, but two, 
they never say no to an opportunity, right? So if somebody's like, uh, all right, well, we want to order 25,000 units. Can you do that? Yes. And then they go figure out how to do it, even though they have no idea, right? Um, and I, I think um, I think so many of us believe that like there's like a qualified team that knows what's what, and we're waiting for somebody to like deem us uh, qualified. But I recognize that like you know how many people turn down the Jackson Five or James Brown or Miles Davis or Elvis or whatever it is, right? Beatles, Beatles like couldn't get signed for a number, like you know they got rejected. So um, so it really means that nobody knows. Like everybody's just making their best guess. And so I feel like if you're making your best guess, you might as well make that best guess on me. And if it fails, you know, like the other thing you chose might have failed too. The one of the people that I had on here a couple of weeks ago, um, Jennifer Gottman, she's a psychologist for like, or yeah, for many, many years, wrote a book called Beyond Happiness, which is really great. Um, but she was talking about how exactly like you said, every decision that we make is a guess and we have this idea we have these two ideas one is that other people's decisions they aren't guesses and the second is the, and is that they know what they're doing and the second is that they're confident in that knowledge and both are false one no one actually knows uh, if they're like yeah this will absolutely work it's like no you don't know everything is a guess you don't know their circumstances you know what's going to happen and it is most of the time you're not actually confident. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, we're all just making our best guess. We're second guessing it all the way up to the end. We're, we're, we're guessing up until we make the decision, then we're second guessing after. It's regardless of how much success you have. I work with seven-figure entrepreneurs all day long. They second guess so many decisions. So much of my job is reinforcing that, hey, they actually made the right decision. That was a good call. Um, it's so common. It's so common. I have to say, uh, it was uh, encouraging to talk to you and to learn what you do because I said this to you in a moment, but uh, I'm basically just, well, making my best guess, right? Like I'm doing it and I feel like what I'm doing is in the spirit of those entrepreneurs, but there's nobody really validating it, right? And so to hear you be like, oh yeah, this is kind of like this and then you're doing it. And I'm like, oh yeah, nice. It was it was cool to hear from your perspective, you know? I am glad, man. It's a... Uh... It, being in this entrepreneur world is not something I ever thought I would end up in. Um, but now that I've been here, God, I started with the comp with um, first ecom entrepreneur world uh, back in 2019. So now it's been four years. Um, it's been my bread and butter. It's literally all I eat, sleep, dream about. Um, it's not at all the world I thought it was. And you're following all all of the correct steps. There's a lot of brands that I have worked with in the past that in brands that are like vet and audit that do things. They think they have it all stand it all outlined. And like one of the things to go back to that conversation we had in person, one of the things that um, so many or that stood out was that you're like, yep, uh, I, I just kind of started and I just kind of took one step forward. And then I said yes to this opportunity. I said yes to that opportunity. And um, this so far, it's been working out really well. And I was able to quit my job and like, this is my full time thing. And like, I get paid here and like, I haven't lost money. There's so many steps that it takes to get there. The fact that you've been able to get to where you are, um, it is. A lot of entrepreneurs don't get there. They start the journey. They get derailed halfway through. Yeah. It's such an interesting thing. I think uh, a lot of it is uh, separating your ego from it, right? Like, what are your goals, right? Because I think um, so many people want to be validated by their businesses rather than um, making sure their businesses su succeed, right? So, uh, like, when I did that Kickstarter, I was renting a house in in Denver, and I moved out and rented a room in somebody else's house for like two and a half years. And it was an, it was a terrible suburb. There were like rooms to go and Walmart and that was like all that was there. Right. And, but I, but I did that because I, I needed to allow my art enough time to build up that I could sustain paying for a place to live, you know? Um, and it was a sacrifice and not everybody can do it. Right. Like I was, I didn't have any kids. I was, you know, single at the time, but, uh, but also like, uh, 
I had a conversation with a comic artist last week and uh, he was like, you know, you should pay for the subscription to Photoshop. Uh, you know, like you're making a living as an artist, right? And I was like, I'm making a living as a writer. Like my drawing is not paying me. So I'm still using GIMP, which is uh, like open source Photoshop. Yeah, and you saw the art that I had at the thing. Like, you know, when the art is making enough money, like the drawing part of it, when it's making enough money to pay for Photoshop, then I will then I will get a Photoshop. You know, but like, and and even like research and printing in China, like the first thing I printed in China, I did with a company called Print Ninja. Um, but it turns out that they're like a, a they're like a middleman, and then they so they they still cost twice as much as if I get directly to China. So I found my way to China. Now it's half what I was spending then, you know. And so like, like basically never trying to spend more than I'm making, never trying to pretend like I'm on a level that I'm not on. Um, and just being reasonable and what it is. Like, is it important to me to be a flashy dresser or have a really nice car? Or is it important to me to live as an artist? It's more important to me to live as an artist. My car is about to... Uh, past 300,000 miles, which I'm actually kind of proud of. But you know, eventually like, you know, uh, more money will come in and I'll do something different with the car. But like being able to live as an artist is about, for me, making choices that serve the ultimate goal. And the goal is to make the business self-sustaining so that I don't have to do things that are damaging to my soul, you know? Mm. Did that become a priority uh, or highlighted as a priority after the insurance? Well, yeah, that, I mean, basically I've done jobs I hated all my life, you know, so, but the insurance, uh, insurance, there were like all these rappers my age who were dying. Uh, and I was like, if I die right now, I would die as an insurance agent. And that just wasn't a thing. I know some great insurance agents. They were good people that I met during that time, but like that wasn't for me, you know? So I really thought about, okay, well, what is the most important thing in my life and how do I move towards that? And um, that's kind of what this has been. Even like doing the TED Talk, you know, I did the TED Talk and it's like almost 3 million views. Like the first thing that I pitched, they actually rejected. And then uh, maybe a year and a half later, we're like, you have any other ideas? And I basically gave them the same idea with just different words. <laughs> Uh, then I did it and it went well. But, you know, for me, that was like, I don't care. I don't care about being famous. I don't care about like the TED Talk having like all these views. What I do care about is that people engage with them and it brings it back to my art. And that helps me make a living as an artist, you know. But if I can figure out how to bank see this shit and be anonymous, I 100 percent would do it. That's fascinating. Yeah, you don't hear a lot of people uh, going who would be like, yeah, I would prefer to be anonymous. I don't hear that often. I'm fundamentally an introvert. Even though I'm good at talking to people, it takes a lot out of me. And uh, and then, I mean, you get death threats, right? You know, like that wouldn't happen if I was anonymous. Right. On that, um, I think we can wrap it up here. Um, it's read about that hour mark. Uh, man, thank you so much. This was, I was so excited to do this. Um, I've been looking forward to this all week and anyone listening, um, go pick this up. Just, just do it right now. Um, if you're a fan of my podcast, then you will be a fan of this comic. Absolutely. Uh, go ahead. Tell everyone listening how they can find the comic, where they can find you, how they can find your art, your writing, the whole shebang. Yeah, man. Uh, first of all, thank you again for having me. Like this has been great. It's a dope conversation. So, uh, I am R. Allen Brooks. And so everything is R. Allen writes, like I'm writing with a W. I have to say Allen, A-L-A-N, because people get confused. Four letters more better. So R. A. L. N. Allen writes, like you're writing with an S. That's what I am on Instagram. That's my uh, my website is rallenwrites.com. On my website, you can find all of my books. You can find my TED Talk. You can find... Uh, you even probably uh, I think there's links to uh, the the movies that we're working on, and oh, and then there's a, a free comic about how to make comics for kids, so like uh, younger people. Like if you want to download it, there's a whole free comic section if you want to just check stuff out and read previews, and uh, yeah. So our Allen Rice is pretty much where you're gonna find me. I love it. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast, my man. Likewise, man. Thank you so much.